Hey everybody, welcome to DeSerto's Pop Flash Review Show presented by DJ Esports. Sign up on djesports.io to immediately participate in the World Prediction Series and earn your deposit bonus for Worlds Stage 2 using promo code DJEX50 for a 50% deposit bonus up to 200 USD. You can also join the DJ Esports Discord for additional bonuses and incentives. So... Joining me today on the show will be none other than the esports historian himself, Thorin. What's up, my dude? How you doing? All right, mate. Not bad. Just did my eighth CSGO World Championship. Broke all the records. Doubled all the old ones. By the way, that's one thing I want to ask you about, right? We'll just start real, right? Because we keep it real, right? It's one thing where on the majors, you know, each time you expect the next majors, you have a chance to maybe like, you know, just boost the old record. So the record from the E-League majors was like 1.3 something. And if you remember, I think it was in like a, a quarters or a semis match. It went to 1.39 or whatever, right? Seven, I think, yeah. Don't you wonder about this? How does it go like that? Like, we'll put three nine oh broke it again 1.4 and at the end it was like and it was 2.5 million for the whole thing like whoa wait a minute how did it almost double how did it almost double what do you think i have my theory on this i have my theory on this i was talking about it earlier on my stream this morning i have my theory about this which is that i think for this two-year period we've actually acquired quite a bit uh, quite a few more fans because cs has been online so much and you know there have been some exciting tournaments in the in the mix so I think there's a, a distinct chunk of uh, CS fans who are only interested in LAN. And so we might have kind of, those guys might have drifted away a little bit during this two-year period where they may not have focused in as much. So they didn't really show up in the numbers, but the numbers didn't really drop. So I think with time, we probably we probably got some more viewers in who've only ever seen like the the online uh, portion of CS, right? This, this two-year period of online CS. And so when it pops back off with the major, first time it's LAN, first time major, Navi with their amazing run, you have all these storylines, the buzz is on. I think that's where we get like those old viewers who are like, oh man, LAN is back. They're coming in to watch. You got the new viewers who are super stoked. They're in here. And then you have, you know, everybody knows Simple. So you got guys coming in from other games that are probably going to watch because they know who Simple is and they want to see, you know, is he going to do it or not, right? And so it's like this perfect storm that just brings everything together for like a, you know, the peak viewer new record, right? Did you, you say that? that they claimed that the peak, which was probably 2.748 million, they claimed that that was more than TI-10? They do. by like, But it's like by 100 viewers or something. Like, it's pretty like, good, though. Like, they have all the Chinese viewers and everything, you know? Yeah. No, like, <laughs> I'm actually looking at the graphic right now. It's like English peak was 1.08 million. Um, YouTube peak was almost 500,000. Like, Russian, dude, were right there up oh, there. Oh, they were right? killing it, what's, yeah. What's amazing is, like... You had the English peak and the Russian peak were pretty much neck and neck at a million viewers. That's amazing, dude. For the whole CIS region to be tuning in like that, that's sick. Plus, we had all that great work done by the teams, not a single one of them from South America or Brazil, in the semifinals where they were all like, by the way, did I mention how much I love Brazil and all the passion of their fans? And their fans were like, oh, this doesn't seem like a trap or anything. Yeah, I'm just going to go ahead and spot this team now. Like, give me a break. Oh. It's farming fans during the semis. That probably did pump the viewership up, I can't lie. We saw that too, didn't we? Where everybody was just trying to uh oh, that's so like, transparent like, light. <laughs> trying to appeal to the Brazilian fans, the Brazilian audience. But I mean, dude, Gaulus is just isn't he like the biggest stream on Twitch now? Like he just has everybody tuning in to yeah. a personal stream. It's like a sure. personal stream. It's not even anything special. Amazing. The dude is just like your killing. dream where you you know you tried to make the major just about you being the only person on stream, but like, oh no, oh, oh shit, oh it's live, oh damn, edit that, edit that post, please. Edit oh no, post. yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, actually, hold on, I was just taking a look. One point three three million for E League, two thousand seventeen. That was the peak, and this one two point seven four. So I mean, like, just oh, blew it out in that mental. It's amazing. I will say as well, though, if you ever know in traditional sports how like viewership records tend to work, it's almost like an old school vibe. What you need, and this is why the final I could easily believe was the peak. What you need is a match that gets so epic. People start calling other people in the old days when you had phones. Nowadays, obviously, people just message other people like, oh, you got to see this game that's going on. Obviously, everyone on Twitter will be seeing like, oh, my God, epic overtime. Like you're seeing the clips coming out. That's what gets, like, you know, the max viewership in. That's it. I think it's the double overtime on Nuke that does it. That's probably where it pushes it over, right? Because when it gets... So the 15-12 happens, and everybody's like, oh, okay, this may be overtime, right? And so you're getting the lads in. And then it goes to double overtime. You know people, you know, like what? I'm not going to say a majority of the audience, obviously, but a big chunk of them must be just tuning in for the la- oh, for those sure. last few rounds. They're just showing up to see like the, the crowning moment. Is this happening or not? I bet you that that viewership just dips off a cliff immediately if it goes to a third map and then we may not be able to hit that peak again until the very end of the third map if it's close. 
Uh, yeah, really cool. I mean, it's just really cool to see. I mean, it puts a lot of it to rest. It's something that I talk about a lot in terms of like the uh, the actual Valve matchmaking servers. That doesn't include, you know, the other third party services for ser for private service and all that. Oh, okay. But like the Valve matchmaking servers are just rock solid at like 500,000 average players a day right now in CSGO, which puts it at somewhere around like 40 million uniques a month, you know? And it's it's just, you know, everybody saying dead game. I'm pretty no sure now you can put all that. If together. anything, the opposite. Like I actually yeah. got the vibe during this major. It did accomplish. It wasn't just because of the talent they hired, but it did have the vibe of like we're trying to rewind the clock and here's what CS used to be like. Because I had loads of people. I'm sure you had this like industry people in my DMs like, oh my god, I forgot how good CS Go is. Like you guys killed it. Like I thought the vibe at the end was really good, despite the fact, by the way, we won't go into this episode. But there was a lot of like sort of scoffed elements around the major. But sure. by the end, it felt awesome, didn't it? It did. I mean, dude. I don't think I saw a mask in the building. You know what I mean? Like, it's like COVID wasn't even a thing. So everybody's reaching out like, oh man, you know, what were the restrictions like, blah, blah, blah. It's like, there were none. I literally forgot during the duration of this event in Stockholm that I, I we could have been transported back two years and I wouldn't have been able to tell the difference. It, it felt like just a normal land. Everybody was super stoked. Everybody was smiling. The vibe in the whole building was amazing. Everybody was just Very good crowd pumped. atmosphere, right? Oh, it was so good. It was so good. So, I mean... It's such a trip now, especially considering, you know, like going forward, it feels like there may be restrictions on events in the future and all that. So For at sure. least we got to have this, you know, like the peak, yeah, yeah. really. It was a little oasis in the desert. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> it really was that. And it wasn't a mirage. It was real. We experienced exactly. it. Feels so good. It wasn't a mirage. That would have been the third map. I know. <laughs> and obviously in this analogy, we're just in the French Legion, like in Tintin style or something like, oh, please, water. After two years, please, water. We saw I am clone. We thought that was the oasis. We got there. Yeah. Carmack was like, this is land. Come in. It's land. It was all just, oh, it's still sand. There's no fans. What are you talking? This is land light. This is There's land. the barrage. There There's the barrage. There you go. <laughs> Even got the yes, all burning there unnecessarily, but whatever. That was it. Oh man, I know, I know. This is that's something I really wanted to hammer home too. You know that this was land with the audience, packed house, not an empty seat in the building. It, yeah, it was just an amazing experience. Mate, and, that semi-final that Gambit played. If you start want to start talking about some of the teams, that's ooh. what shows you the difference between LAN and all the other, even the semi-LAN we had. Because that particular match, like I've never seen Gambit play that sort of like lackluster or just just the idea they they did they, they had no power to win this game. Like they looked totally powerless, didn't they? They were like they were doing their strats. They were, some of the players were hitting a few shots, but like that wasn't the team I saw dominate the rest of the year. And it's why, unfortunately, I did tell people during the online era, I can't know who until we get back to land but some people will have that asterisk next to what they did because it's not like Gambit isn't good like Nafani's comment after the tournament by the way was a totally legit comment you cannot dispute that at his first major he made the semi-finals if you just track a normal person's career that's amazing to make semi-finals in your first major the problem is though dude now it makes all those championships and how dominant you were look illegitimate like it, it, it isn't illegitimate but it's just it's not the same as being on land is it so unfortunately until they win the lands it's always going to feel like eh, would they really have won those if those had been lands you know the return of the onliner like or onliner actually regains yes. its real value as a term now because that that's exactly and also well i mean other uh, other teams that notable heroic. I mean, if we're gonna, if we want to just at least just touch on the on the playoffs right off the bat here, but I mean, heroic were a team that made it just as deep and put up a hell of a they fight. Great, didn't they? Yeah, it was an amazing fight, an all out battle with G two, and yet you know, and so does that? Do you think that that redeems heroic a little bit? That they really went out just all guns blazing in that semifinal. Yes. It's not like they were a blowout at all. No, here's the thing. What makes their story great is it was like in their problems were in the Swiss systems. They looked like the Swiss systems, maybe they are online. It's a bit like, you know, they lost a bit of their nerve every time it was a 14 14 game or they could never just 2 0 people in the series, even though they were a massive favorite. But I thought, actually, yes, in the playoffs, they like, they actually sort of grew into the LAN element. And by the semi finals, I don't blame them at all for that semi final. I, mean, I thought they played a great semi final and they easily could have been in the final. I thought it would even be an interesting matchup for Navi, except a guy called Nico just decided he wanted to be in the final instead that's about it right I can't even blame them I told most of them privately like you can feel bad about all the elements of the tournament but like you did everything right in that semi it's, the other guy's just better that's pretty much I mean he had uh, the highest rating of the, the entire tournament on that Inferno map the third map of that uh, best of three it was he was untouchable it was a god tier performance from Nico there's no getting around it so it's a good point to make for sure I mean let's uh, let's all right so I really want to talk about the playoffs, but I also, I mean, that's the thing, the comment going into this is that we actually had two back-to-back -back Swiss systems. So rather than, you know, I think maybe we'll just try and take a couple of points from each of these phases because yeah, really it's, well, then, uh, 
it's pretty wild. But like already, let's we can just get right into the new challenger stage. And I mean, Face Clan and Copenhagen Flames topping that one. And I guess Copenhagen Flames kind of proven that uh, they're not a team to be messed with, right? There was maybe a little bit of an element of flukery going on with I Am Fall. We were like, ah, did, do they really deserve it or not? And then they blow through their groups and beat Heroic 2-1. Oh, I thought actually that team was easily the more like the revelation of the tournament, essentially, because you you look at them, forget the fact that like, you know, teams like G2 had a lapse before the tournament, they came in strong. The point is the pieces were always there for them to be good. One of the reasons I noticed a lot of my fellow analysts did like me, and until the bitter end, they just picked against Copenhagen Flames every single game. And the reason why is if you looked at even who's in the team, you were like, these guys aren't going to be the next great Danish players. Also, Hooks, he's not like some legendary game leader. The highest rated player for most of the tournament was Roy, who everyone remembered as a sort of like the blue collar worker in Mad Lions, not a star player. So every factor on paper looked like this isn't real. Like, come on, you know, they're going to wake up tomorrow. They're going to find out that the fucking carriage is turning into a pumpkin and the dream's over, isn't it? Like, that's the end, Cinderella. Just got to go back to normal life. But I have to say, right until the bitter end, until the very end of the second Swiss system as well, even, they, these guys just fought the whole way. I was actually very impressed. Like, for that, I don't know whether they'll survive beyond this major, but for that one major, it's like they just were actually a legit team like they had a map pool they had a nice style of play different players contributed as the event went on it was just really impressive stuff do you think do you so you think it's the perfect storm everything aligned for them and it just it was it was it was all there because now they're ranked number 10 according to hltv they're ranked number they're 10 they're gonna drop from that surely you know if they don't by the way fair play to them maybe they're the new ends and they're gonna sort of rise up that could happen occasionally but i would say yeah pro i would expect them to sort of just fall back and maybe they use the experience and you know they become like the 17th best team that would be cool but i i don't know and also obviously it goes without saying you often mention because of who copenhagen flames is as an orc they're basically the new copenhagen wolves like the whole thing is they know that they're not the biggest orc in the world but they know that the big orgs need players such as players who've done at a major and they immediately just said if you have seven hundred fifty thousand dollars, you just buy the whole team yeah, come and get it tomorrow so i think there's a world where they probably don't even stay in this organization remember no joke copenhagen flames i think were the only org in csgo to be profitable it would make sense if you look who they sold yeah exactly because they figured out the model they're like we find the we find the talent and then we sell them to the other teams and we make a profit like that and they are literally because it costs so little to pay those rosters at the beginning it's not like they're bringing in big stars they're going to demand big salaries so very little on the upkeep and then boom you get one result you start selling players you make a profit you invest into new players that aren't going to cost you much and i'm just blown away by their capability to keep doing this year after year i mean if they sell this roster boom right there they're probably right in the green again it's amazing what they've done. This is like such an insane team on the back end as well as on the server. Also, if you, if people don't remember, like as you all alluded to, it's not like it's the first time they've done this. If people don't oh. know, Tessess, who's in Heroic now, was in Copenhagen Flames when we did Flashpoint 1. So was that guy Farley, who later on went onto the Godsend, later FPX team. Like they've had a whole bunch of players come through. So that team just understands the premise of like, we're a smaller team. And then when you get the good players, you sell them for a big buyout and then you try and do it all over again. Yeah, it's amazing. It's amazing. I mean, credit to them. Credit to them. That's really And by the way, they were really close to making top eight as well. Like that match with NIP was some epic stuff. Yeah, we're going to talk about that. That was in the legend stage in the in the next oh, yeah, uh, sure. roundabout. Because, I mean, yeah, Copenhagen Flames, they were the team to get out second in uh, challengers. So there was the first, the first, let's say, stage of this tournament was a 16-team Swiss system right out the gates with eight teams having to qualify it in. I mean, just all out brawl. And well, I mean, we can, okay, we started with the teams that actually made it through. We can kind of touch on some of the teams that didn't quite make the cut. And um, I guess one of the big ones that didn't make it to the next stage would be big. I mean, do you think that they awesome. lack power right now? Because it feels like, right, you know, they, they played it close versus Ents and Maus, but it wasn't enough each time they fell short. Yeah, the big problem for me is the teams that they lost to, because on paper, they are supposed to be a better side than those teams. I even thought some of the things they showed in the server, it did look like they had put in work. But two things, one, I know actually, like, basically, there's a whole thing going on where they've just replaced, they've bought an old NKJ, who was obviously with a bunch of teams over the years to replace Legia. I know Legia always said, if you want to have an actual real tactical team, you can't just do it overnight. It takes months and months to build up the system. So they looked a little bit like they were still in like rebuilding mode with Gade, quite frankly. Some of it would look like at times they would look good in the games. And some of the series they lost, actually, they were looking like they were going to win the series. So I agree. The main problem is they haven't solved the whole Zantares departing issue. They haven't got anyone who can put up that kind of firepower. Remember, this guy was one of the better aimers in CSGO. 
especially online, obviously, the Garros are monsters. So I think the problem they have was they were hoping to make it like it doesn't matter how much skill we've got because look at what a great tactical system we're going to have. But they also didn't really have time to implement that. So I do think if they could have if snuck through, which they almost did in this phase, they could have done something against the other teams, especially with more time, you know. But I think I don't think it, put it this way, I don't think they were going to make top eight with how they were playing. Like, I think it's not unreasonable that they went out at this point. So you think, okay, because that was going to be my follow-up question, which is essentially that they, I, I expected them to make it out of this point. I expected yes. them to make it, to, to have enough firepower and like you say, to have the tactical system with Tabson and Ligia, you know, in the back, in the back line, making it all happen. I expected them to make it through this one, but not to make it through the legend stage, obviously. I did not expect them to make top eight of the tournament. But I do think it's, it, it is them dropping the ball a little bit here, just barely missing the cutout, you know, two losses or two wins, three losses and barely missing the cutout for the next stage. Hmm. But another team that actually I think there was that upset potential or do you think that there was that upset potential or did they miss their peak? The next one is Team Spirit, right? Because they also Ooh. went the distance, two wins, three losses, lost O2 to Astralis in the end. But it feels like that was a team for a while there online. They were a real threat. But when they came here onto land, they weren't quite uh, packing that punch. Oh, I was riding with Spirit the whole way. Yeah, I thought the problem they had was they were just on and off. Like, the games they were on, I mean, they almost won the series against Virtus Pro and just qualified, yeah. you know, 3-1. Like, they were up, I think, something meant like 13-7 on the third map, like, overpass. They were in a really good position, and then they let the game slip away. And then when they played against Astralis in the last game, that was an example, again, of, like, the whole this is land moment for you. Because that's an example, right, of where if that was the first best of three the teams play, I think Spirit might actually edge that one out. They would just play normally. But you could tell in that game they knew like if we lose this we're out and they sort of played a bit scared meanwhile Astralis just played like they knew that, the, that their opponent was in that position it just looked like experience just dominated them in some ways so I thought the Spirit like they are what they are like they have some skilled players I don't think the actual team element is very good they seem a bit disconnected and they're obviously mega inexperienced in terms of like the idea they're going to make a playoff run here so I think too many of those factors conspired against them like at the end of the day if you touted some big firepower team but you can't beat what was like a semi lackluster Astralis team, you probably shouldn't be in the next phase of the tournament. Yeah, that's actually reflected as well. They've kind of dropped down in the rankings after this lost three spots after that uh, that ejection from the tournament. Not only that, their their org didn't even waste any time. As soon as they didn't yeah, make it the stage before the tournament even's over, they're like, yeah, actually this is going to be the end of this project and they're going into a way. I don't know about you, but when I see something like that happen, and that has almost implied to me, like maybe they even told the team before, like this is your last chance, and then that, that probably adds even more pressure. I've no doubt in a match like that. Oh man, that's always uh, that's always you, you always wonder if they have an idea that that the hammer's coming. But man, that would be brutal. Talk about pressure. You're right. I mean, other teams uh, kind of keeping an eye on it here. I mean. Uh, in the lower portion of that, uh, Tyloo actually managed to picking up a win against uh, mm, Sharks. But I don't really know in terms of, like, it feels like everything else kind of lined up. I mean, tr I mean, we could actually touch on Entropic a little bit just because oh, so they were able to get that win over Heroic 2-1, uh, giving Heroic one of their losses in the group. So do you feel like Entropic were able to really take the world by storm here? Yeah, I think after Copenhagen Flames, the obvious other team you would point to would be Entropic because if you look at them as a team, like they were also a team where the whole hype I remember was like, oh, they did well in like CAS, RMR, which again, people don't really know, people don't really care, this is Gambit or Na'Vi. And then secondly, it was like, oh, this Elian guy is really good, which by the way, he was. But what we didn't know was how many of them actually looked like they adapted to land instantly. And they got, this looked like a team that was pretty good the whole way through the tournament quite frankly it's, I thought by the by the time they got maybe some of the nerves or the pressure it wasn't until right before we were at sort of the quarterfinals so I think there's a world where this team could have been like they could have basically snuck into the playoffs I don't think that they'd have done anything there but but yeah, they were looking good on a whole bunch of maps. It was matching up against many different squads. And it's only, again, once sort of the weight and the stakes really kick in that some of these teams fall apart. Like, I like the fact that when there isn't as much pressure, they were able to play their game. Well, actually, let's just go ahead and segue right into the next uh, Legend stage, because I feel like, you know, the, the teams that we were expecting to make it through, we have made it through. Copenhagen, Flames, Entropic, these are the teams that really just kind of, you know, popped up. And, I mean, Entropic almost went the distance in the Legend stage as well, which was the following stage of Swiss to determine the top eight of the tournament. So this was what people considered the actual major. Like, you made it through the Challenger stage. That was kind of like the warm-up qualifier. Now you're in the Legend stage. This is the 16 teams. This is the tournament. And Entropic went the distance. They Two wins, three losses, and they lost in a best of three, all three maps against Vitality. So no slouch. That, they took a map off Vitality. They almost made it. 
all the teams they lost to, obviously, because the way it worked, they were the teams that made it through in the playoffs. Like it was yeah. G two who ended up being one of the best teams of the whole tournament. Furia, I'll admit that was a surprise to me. But then again, I doubt Entropic and Furia have much overlap. So I'm sure stylistically it's a bit of a nightmare if you're the guys from Entropic to prepare for. And then the Vitality series at the end, if people don't remember, the reason Apex went absolutely mental when he won that 1v3 is that basically would have been Entropic 2-0. Like they were just going to be into the playoffs and without like the pressure of the third map, etc. So I think this team, this is an example of one where it's like, is another world where easily they could have been in the playoffs. Isn't that the most insane thing? And then taking Zywu and Vitality out of the picture as well. Would have been well, massive, wouldn't it? It would have been insane. But I mean, as far as uh, the rest of them are concerned, I mean, oh, uh, we can't have that as well. Zywu right? was absolutely bonkers in all those series as well. So you had another like player who's like super god tier. And if these if these players just have a whole series, you're just not going to win. Sometimes it is always your fault. Well, I mean, talk about uh, talking about Zywu. I mean, heard on the back line that essentially Apex turned to him and said, "Listen, if you don't wake up, if you don't show up in these in this tournament, we're done. We're going home." And you know, talk about putting pressure on players. Suppose that's that works just fine for Zywu. He was able to bear up under it because he certainly showed up for Vitality. Oh. He came he came in big because they had their backs to the wall. The Legend stage did not start strong for Vitality at all. They lost to Virtus Pro. They lost to Heroic. And then they kind of get gifted a win with EG. But even then, they struggled. It was a 2-1 against EG. Yeah, they lost the map. That was, that was brutal against Evil Geniuses. But then they net Evil Geniuses, they net Astralis, and then they barely squeak the win through on, on Tropics. I mean, talk about a team just, you know, really cutting it close to get into the top eight of the tournament. I mean, Vitality, they don't go on to really do anything, but then they also got Na'Vi first round and... Well, nothing was going to stop Navi essentially from uh, from winning this tournament by the by the looks of things at the beginning. So that was a quick two zero, and they were out of it. But I mean, as far as the top of the group is concerned, and this was a, a thread that kind of carried on through the rest of the tournament, which was really cool, is that out of the group stage, Navi G two, they both make it through three zero, and then of course they meet again in the grand finals and just go toe to toe. So was this, I mean, was this the expected result for you? Was there anything crazy about G2 being a part of these two teams at the top of the pack? To me, it's just that, like, of all the teams with all the, like, veteran players who tried to talk a big game about, like, oh, we'll be different on LAN. Like, obviously, FaZe made that a massive end part of their emphasis, you know. The problem is, when you can and Astralis, I think people assumed to be better on LAN. G2 actually delivered. Like, when they came here, you would never have believed the last two months happened. All the, like, drop-off in form, losing series to everyone, losing loads of their maps, ruining their whole win rate of the map pool. Like, by the time they came here, it's like they had rewound the clock and they were even, as you saw, they would just pick Mirage, the map that they liked the most, again and again and again and again, no matter what the map pool actually said. They never went until the final into sort of like a punish pick or like a weird pick or somewhere. They just played their bread and butter and they just said, especially because it's Mirage, like, Nico just go to work. Like, the joke the meme is they did just say Nico go kill and he did an amazing job I mean he's posted some of the best stats ever in his career and ever in a major so when you have that happen with a superstar player and you've got the maps that allow it you, you give yourself a good chance in these games and then yeah some of the other players also kind of lived up performances Nexa and Hunt were pretty good over the tournament like I actually thought by the way kind of like the Vitality story this is another team that behind the scenes knows probably this lineup is dead. You know, a couple of players are probably going to get removed. Let's see who it is. But the difference is, unlike maybe Team Spirit, who if they knew that, it made them maybe chalk up a little bit this team if anything it made people just say right screw it i'll just just let's just let's just go for one last chance go as hard as we can if we lose we lose whatever but as you saw they were able to grind up some amazing wins and get some dominant wins too oh yeah i mean they took down the hot copenhagen, copenhagen flames to start they took down phase clan but then they also 2-0 in tropic who were definitely hot out the gates so i mean they they that was just a legend stage and of course we can get into their playoff uh, run as well after this but i mean What's already crazy as well, just to add on, is that Nico is posting some of the most dominant stats out of any player at any tournament, and he's doing it all with a rifle. It's not like he, it's not even like he's opping. It it is legitimately like they are just going to hard carry so hard they don't even need the op to get the job done. So oh, I mean, it, it, he's just one of the best AK players ever, isn't he? and you saw in this particular series, and in fact, all of them that he played pretty much all the best of three series, he just took over. Yeah, that was the really, I mean, he's got, he, he, there are, there are a few players where he's got such a clean style that you can just recognize him. You don't even need to see the name. If you see him using an AK, you're like, that's Nico. You know that, that it's him. It's really sick to see. And uh, it's very cool. It shows uh, that there is a way to stand out as a player. It's not all just about the big green gun. So that was very cool. But I mean, middle of the pack of the legend stage, you know, heroic Gambit, Furia, Gambit, 
you know, they start off with a win against uh, Ents. Then they get into that inter-region rivalry, right, where it's CIS. Uh, they go up against Entropic. Don't get that one. But then they do beat Virtus Pro and they take down Nip 2 0. So, I mean, do you remember what you were thinking about Gambit already, already at the uh, Legend stage? Were they living up to your expectations? No, because the problem was when they got to that game against Entropic, which ended up being on Vertigo, that was where the real Gambit was supposed to come out. Like we built them up on the desk. Like they had a stat that that year they had like a 30 and 3, 30 wins, three losses on Vertigo. So we were building it like this is the best team in the world on this map. Like, you know, normally all the CIS teams veto it against them. So now we're going to re see the real Gambit. You know, the game. and then they lost the game. And then right after that, they played Vertus Pro on the same map and they barely won 16 14 because Hobbit dropped 39 kills so actually after those two games i remember just thinking like real gambit has never arrived so far so i was hoping like you do as an analyst right maybe as each like round of the tournament goes on like you get to the top playoffs and you play an easier right. opponent like you got there you, you know you can, as long as you get by the semis so you're near your peak form it won't matter you can be good then but as i think we saw in this tournament and this was kind of the omen that like hinted at it i don't think real gambit ever really arrived here because real gambit doesn't exist in the LAN environment yet. Like they showed flashes even when they were at Cologne, but they were never in their super dominant peak. So I think it's more, this is why fans don't get it. We're not hating on anyone who did it online by saying they haven't done it online. It's just that until you've done it online, no one can know that you can. It's a sink or swim environment, you know. But I mean, land competition is the pinnacle of Counter-Strike as well. That really is it. So it is such a shame. And we've been saying it from the beginning of this land phase, of this online phase, where it, it there is always going to be, like you said, that asterisk next to their, next to each tournament win, where it's like, yes, you won. Yes, you won against the best. But it was online. It wasn't on LAN. And that's, I think that's why, you know, another reason why we broke this record is everybody knows that peak CS is LAN CS. They're not going to tune in for the online CS. The online CS is kind of just like, okay, fine. If, if there's nothing else on, <laughs> you know, just, it's not the same level of intensity. Whereas when you have the fans here, you know, you can hear the fans through the commentator mics when they're popping off with the Navi chants, you know, it's just crazy. That adds a completely different layer to it. So that that wasn't what the players were experiencing yet in the legend stage. The legend stage was still being played in like a boot camp kind of environment uh, where the players could actually hear each other if they shouted. So they were in a big room, so they could hear each other. So you had that element, but you didn't obviously have the the fan element involved yet. So that's one thing that was uh, that wasn't there. I mean, one one team that actually I think is pretty cool to have made it through. Uh, especially considering, I mean, you know, they're South American, but they're coming through the North American side of things, right? They get that spot that way. But Furia managed to make the run, and they even managed to make the run by taking down Entropic 2-1. So taking out some real competition in order to get that spot in the playoffs. What did you make of their run? Yeah, the thing with Furia is I just think that their issue is, like, the team that they played against in the playoffs was just one of the worst for them to match up against. Like, I don't think there was really a world they were going to beat Gambit, even though Gambit didn't come in best form. I thought, actually, they were a surprising team. Like, unfortunately, like a lot of people, I've kind of written off NA. Like, I thought Team Liquid, because of the players they have, maybe could have done something here. But I wasn't kind of riding with Furia because I can't really know what their level of form is. Like, they haven't been that great when they've played in Europe. Back in NA, no one really knows what to make of any of the teams over there. Like, if unfortunately, if we see people like Pain Gaming and Triumph beat you or go close for you, it makes us think your teams aren't that good. So I think Furia probably, when I look at how they performed in the tournament, probably got slept on a bit. We probably didn't know that they were actually still a solid team. Fair play to them, by the way. You can tell a bunch of their players have played lands before we went to this online era because they were still playing the same style they played. I, actually, I thought that was one of the things that played to their benefit is when people, I remember it was months and months ago, I know it was Yanko and Nico and a bunch of the FaZe players thought this especially. When they made all those comments last year about, you know, the, the problem is the guy sat at home playing me and he's got, you know, his favourite soda brand soda and he's in his comfy chair and all. what they mean by that is like you won't go for that play if you're online and if you've got like the sweat running down your head you hear all the fans you might just go for a conservative play there it's not as easy to just play like wild and free like certain people did the Fury guys still do it, although, mate. Like, they still go for those super ballsy players. And so you saw when it worked out, like, it still catches people off guard online. People kind of want to play a little bit safer when it's a line environment, I feel. Yeah, and actually, I mean, really cool. You could see the how they carried themselves body language wise when they walked out on the stage. They had like, I oh, man, shoot, I can't remember what it's called, Chaffe or something like that. Like a cool style, you know, with like the sunglasses. You remember they dyed their hair and they had the sunglasses. And they're just walking out, owning the stage, and you're like, okay, these guys look confident. You know, they don't look like they're kind of mincing about here. They're looking like they're here to do some damage. So it wasn't like it was a blowout against Gambit either. That was actually quite cool for them to actually show what they were capable of on the main stage and get that opportunity. 
and oh man, I do wish that they could have made it a little bit deeper because the, fa- the the Brazilian fans, man, in the audience, dude, they just get they just get hype. It's so sick to see. It's so much fun. They add that extra layer to the stream. That's awesome. So the difference is, you know, years and years ago, like obviously when we were in the land period, that was their first year coming up. So at the time, they were more of like a flash in the pan, you know, no one knew how good they actually were. If you see by now, this is why it's sad we haven't had more lands. People like Keir Serato, they're just ready to be some of the best players in the world, man. Like every time they come to these tournaments now, they just look amazing. So I would like to see this team play a lot more for sure. Yeah, without a doubt. And I'm glad you mentioned Keir Serato because, yeah, he's definitely one of those guys who looks confident and willing to do some damage. So... Guys, real quick, a reminder that Pop Flash is presented by DJ Esports. The first 10 players to reach 60,000 DJT in their DJE wallet will win 50 XRP. So act fast. Use promo code DJ5050, deposit 50, and get 50 USDT back. Limited to first 20 people. Sign up now so you don't miss out. So very cool to see that Caserato was definitely in there. Great, Very cool to see Fury as well representing because, I mean... You know, if you're going to take over NA, you better make it deep into the tournament because yes. then you are the representation of that entire continent pretty much. So cool to see Furia really getting in there with the Brazilian hype CS. And while, you know, sp- talking about actually having to rep a bit, I do want to talk about Nip a little bit because they definitely had a sweating in that group stage. I thought, you know, when they get up 2-0, right, things are looking good, but they run into Navi. <laughs> that did not go well. They run into Gambit, also going down 0-2, probably kind of losing in their own minds, it felt like. And then they barely squeaked the win 2-1 over Copenhagen Flames for a deciding spot. That was to decide who was going forward into top eight. So, I mean, what did you think of the ninjas here, man? The problem is, if you only look at the teams that beat them in the tournament, you could easily say they might be the fourth best team there because, look, they lost to Na'Vi, Gambit, sure. and obviously in the playoffs they lost to G2, right? So you think, well, there's nothing wrong with those. Those are respectable team. But the problem is the Copenhagen Flames series is the one that's the killer to me because that isn't a team that was a dominant team that was going to win, and you barely got that one. So to me, the problem Nip had was they could be good in short bursts. They could be really good on a CT half, or they could have one map where they looked really nice. But I felt like, actually, this squad, by the time they got to this tournament, they didn't look like they were well-rounded enough like the team that online got that number two ranking in the world that team didn't show up to this tournament for me and even player wise a whole bunch of them had sort of underwhelming majors like I found Devices player just decent you know it wasn't great it certainly wasn't the kind of superstar level you thought when you bought him Rez obviously fell off a cliff a little bit it was actually if anything the guy who seemed to carry them was Hampus and by the way I always have to mention this he isn't just a player on the team if he was just a player doing get right lurks on CT side he's doing a brilliant job he's in-game leader and they had at one point some stat like they won 29% of T-side rounds. So the problem they had as a squad was they never fixed that fatal flaw somehow. And some of the players, I think maybe the nerves of the moment got to them. I'd, I'd agree. I mean, we were looking through this and uh, Hampus is the top rated player for Nip, but with a 1.08 rating by the end of the tournament. Yeah, where's so all the fragging like exactly? Over. Yeah. And then you, go, you still go down and Device barely squeaked a 1.04. And he's so, getting the up all the time, guys. It's not like he's not getting his weapon. They're setting him up for success, but he just it wasn't just wasn't a great tournament for him. I think he kind of admitted it himself. You could see at the end. There was some clear frustration on his part. But there there was a player I think who could be frustrated as well and who was getting quite a bit of attention in the legend stage and then into the playoff stage. It was Rez. Everybody kept talking him up. Anders wouldn't shut up about it. You know, like Rez is gonna do this. And I'm like, okay, fair enough. I want to see it. Let's go. Yes. Like Rez, it's his moment to shine. If he's gonna be this star rifler that really gets unlocked by device and they can work together as a duo, I don't feel like we saw that at all. I feel like Rez uh, didn't show up for the team. No, because people build it that he was gonna be like the Scotty Pippen to devices Michael Jordan exactly. one day and they were gonna exactly. carry the team, whereas he definitely never turned up at all like that. And the problem I have with that is Rez is a veteran at this point in time, guys. Like you have to remember, I think he joined an IP, I'm gonna say in like it was in 2017 or something. Like it was, wasn't yep. like just even just before the online. It was a long time ago now. So I think he's a good player. And I cer- he certainly seems like you know a good teammate and all that jazz. And at times he has these little, as Richard says, a purple patch of form where you have a few months where you look really good. But at the major yeah he was the player for me that if he did turned up they could have actually maybe done something here yeah because it wasn't you weren't actually going to get any more support he ended with a 0.93 and then you have to go way down to find plopsky and lnz you know who are both like 0.8 0.7 so without rez showing up to give a bit more firepower to hampus and device it was going to be tough but i mean i don't even know if they had enough firepower to be able to go toe-to-toe with the teams that made top four doesn't seem like it i mean those guys are just pop you got you've got just heavy hitters i mean uh, Vitality had the unfortunate um, luck, I guess, to run into Navi. But I mean, Simple, Nico, and Zaiwu round out the top three of the entire tournament at the end of it. So without those guys on your team, 
it's going to be pretty difficult to, 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 to get some results. By the way, though, I do love that part as well, because when you come to LAN, if we're going to say to all these other teams, like, that's what the difference between online and LAN, we have to have those exact names at the top of the scoreboard. Like, those are the superstars of LAN, of course. Uh, that's why we want to say to the Axiles, Sheroes of the world, like, this is what you've got to do, mate. It's not about what you did for six months online in your chair at home. Yeah, without a doubt. Without a doubt. That's the, the, the brutal reality. Uh, especially when you're on a star sort of level. I mean, I was thinking, and I, it's fun. I haven't glanced at this just yet at the top. I was kind of looking for the nit players earlier, but uh, you know, Navi <laughs> out of the top five. Yeah, everyone um, met. Yeah, no, they had three. The simple electronic and bit are all in the top five performers of this tournament over the course of ten maps. I mean, that's a tremendous amount of firepower to work with if you're if you're awesome. blade as a coach on that team. It's insane. Also, think about this. Everyone expects Simple would be in that list. Yes, of course. But the idea, like a rookie, Blitz is basically, as far as I know, this is like his second real LAN. And he already, by the way, stomped the other one where it was IEM Cologne. So the idea, he's just going to keep doing it through a whole major. Like, you would actually bet against that if you kind of had to take odds. And then the last one is the one that we're all going to forget because of how well other people played, which is Electronic. Electronic just quietly had a monster tournament. In fact, you saw by the time it was the final, he was, his impact kills were enormous because there's another player, like kind of like Nico, where he's a rifle master and just online it doesn't show up as much because here's the secret everyone online there isn't a concept of a tier one opera the top 20 opera's in the world just tool everyone and it looks like a frag movie for them but when you got to a LAN there are a couple of opera's can mess up people like Nico and Electronic but there's only a couple aside from that they are dominant players with their AK so I thought you saw it in this tournament as well like Electronic's just a different player on LAN Oh, he's so impressive, without a doubt. And it, it does feel good because he does feel like he kind of lives in simple shadow for a long time. You know, it's always been simple getting a lot of the attention and electronic. I mean, he, he does get mentioned, don't get me wrong, but, you know, the kind of drop off where the expectations weren't yes. quite there. To see him turn up in this fashion at the major was truly something. It was really cool to see. So congratulations to him. Good on him. Absolutely. But, um, you know, before we get into the uh, the top eight and we can start, you know, kind of digging in on that one. I mean, do we want to talk about FaZe Clan at all? Sure. It, it feels like there was a lot of attention on FaZe Clan coming into this tournament, that they were going to try and at least make it into the playoffs. And personally, I feel like if they could have made it into the playoffs and gotten in front of the fans, we could have. it could have been like Nitro in the engine for them, and they could have just started actually hitting a different level maybe because with the experience that's on that roster. I mean, would you agree that um, FaZe could have done a bit more if uh, they could have got to the, to the top eight? And put it this way, they would have at least been a team where I wouldn't have expected those players to like fall apart in front of a crowd or anything like that. Like if they'd have played if they'd have played like one of the underdogs, like a raucous man, I'd certainly be very interested to see what would happen. The problem FaZe Clan had in this tournament was the first Swiss system. That, that was fool's gold because it came with Carrigan as like one of the highest straight players in the whole tournament, literally fragging everyone out the server. Like that was never going to last. If you saw by the end of the tournament, understandably, he was one of the worst rated players because when he got in, in there with the big boys, he's, he's not going to own in that way. So to me, if he's going to dominate like that, I think even Olaf had a map where you, he had a high fragging potential. Like I think that was some like once in a blue moon stuff. And once you actually got down to brass tacks, FaZe Clan did still look a little bit disjointed and some of the players just didn't have very good games. And like, I think overall, it's like we all just hoped it would they would have the perfect run through the tournament. Like basically, we hoped they had like what Open Cup again in Flames got where everything just seems to work out. But instead, they had a few moments that were very good. But once you actually got down to brass tacks, I agree, they would have been nice to throw in as a wild card in the playoffs. But I do also think going out in this phase of the tournament is, like, is fair for their performance and who they were as a team. Well, looking back at the opponents that they actually faced in the legend stage and that they got wins over and losses, I mean, they beat EG. EG feels like they were just, you know, doomed for failure this tournament, unfortunately for them because of all the roster issues that they're having right now. So, no, you know, that was kind of like the freebie going into it. They lose to G2, they lose to Copenhagen Flames, and then they beat Liquid. And similar, similar story for Liquid where... It doesn't really feel like Liquid were at all in a position to do damage this tournament. Didn't feel they felt disjointed. They didn't feel like they really had any kind of driving force behind them. And then they fall to Virtus Pro in that last game to decide whether or it not it was a very close series through. as well. Like if yeah. people don't know, there's another problem they had. Even though VP themselves had flaws, what they were able to do at this tournament was they, they were just the ultimate grinders. They were just the team that made you work the hardest. And unfortunately, in that phase clan, that's it seems where phase clan almost two zeroed. But then when they just let VP back in the door, they just got ground out. And so I think that was just that was the, the wrong opponent to get in that last matchup, unfortunately. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a tough break. I mean, James, I mean, they, they really did actually turn it around. Virtus Pro it was looking pretty dicey for them, but uh, a win over Mouse, win over FaZe, and uh, that got them through. So, 
a big congratulations to uh, Virtus Pro. I mean, another you know, speaking of Mouse, actually, I mean, there's the, there's our boy Rops on there. Um, what do we make of, of uh, Mouse's performance? I mean, it feels like we are going to have to see some kind of change coming through. Otherwise, this team is still going to remain in the doldrums. The problem is, I know loads of the analysts feel this way as well. Do they're all hating on Rops hard? Because if you watched him play in this particular phase of the tournament, you could tell he knows that this team isn't good, they're not going to make it, and he's not going to be there. Because he looked like, basically, it was like if you're playing like a solo game and you have a load of money in the game. Like, you're just going to bait people. You're just going to go, I'm not dropping you a gun. You know, all that's like, that's almost what the vibe I was on. He was kind of baiting his teammates a bit, basically. And so, unfortunately, I get the sense that, like, that was an example as well, I think, of a team that knows it's like a dead team walking i mean let's be real though if people don't know the whole reason that information is out there is because basically people around drops just got it out there that you know he wants the teams to come and buy him out here's what the buyout is here's how long the contract is and sort of like you know if it's a team i want to join they want me to join let's just make it happen let's sort of it all be in but so the problem is you can't then just pretend like if you're the other teammates around like oh cool like we're working towards something like hey let's make top eight and we can build on that you know you can't it's kind of like if he's your best player the team's going to be effectively dead or rather restarted when he leaves so I feel like both parties Rops and Mouse had that vibe about them I actually thought they actually did well to get to this point like I thought they could have gone out in the previous phase they were one of the teams that played Big Clan they were in this particular phase I actually had them as my 0-3 team I know it sounds like I'm hating but I just didn't think they would be able to win a best of three against anyone so I'll give them credit. They slightly overperformed what I expected. But as a team, I think they were basically, if you go back to that Flashpoint 3 RMR, I think that was the crazy one-off fluke. I don't think I don't think we ever saw that again from our sports. No, I mean the the one team what the one win that they noted was uh, against Ents 2-0. And Ents are also a team that kind of really uh feels like caved under the pressure. I don't feel like yes. I mean there's no information out there talking about some kind of dead team walking with this roster. So uh -huh. What uh, what do you think caused them to fall apart like this in the legend stage? Because that felt really weird. It felt like they could have some firepower here going into it. Yeah, I think this was just an example of why you can't take essentially a complete rookie team. Because if people don't know the piece of trivia, right, because obviously the first week of the major that we currently have used to basically be called the major qualifier and then you made it into the top 16. Technically, on HLTV, for example, they don't count that as the major. They make them separate major rankings. So if you ever go and look, this was the first time Snappy himself has even made top 16 at a major and he is the veteran. So when you get beyond Snappy, the rest are all babies. Like, it's amazing that they actually are so good as they are now like they've gotten together this crazy crop of players that weren't super highly touted elsewhere but they've got a really nice bundle of them together and I just felt like yes once they got to this particular the new legend stage they weren't even the team they were the week before the week, team they were the week before looked pretty impressive like I also thought like you know they could do damage they, I had them making top eight potentially they were kind of on the brink for me but I do think they played an underwhelming game and this I think they kind of gave opponents wins yeah, that's the, the I mean, they, they go 0-2 to Mouse Sports, a team that was struggling, right? So if they're going to go to, uh, if you're going to be giving up maps to Mouse Sports to Liquid, I mean, they lose to Gambit as well. First round, they lose to Gambit. So it's like, fine, fair enough. You lose to Gambit, okay, fair. You you shake your shake that off and, and move on. But then they proceed to lose to Liquid. And uh, I think that's where alarm bells start ringing and you start wondering what's going on because it didn't look like Liquid. I mean, before moving into the champion stage, let's go ahead and let's go ahead and mention our NA hopefuls, essentially. Like, Team Liquid... Um, still a mix. Fallen is still in the mix on that team. Feels like they're still trying to figure out what's going on. They didn't have their coach for this event. Um, is there any big takeaway from Team Liquid apart from it feels like this team is going to start uh, start with a roster change soon? I could, obviously people will have heard the rumor anyway that like Fallen's going to leave the team, etc. I've basically heard in that squad that it's kind of, I mean, they've admitted it themselves that, you know, we're not on the same page or whatever jazz like that. I've heard basically it's quite similar. Like you look at the players they have on paper, they should be so much better than they are. They even have shown in the online games in Europe, like they show flashes of being really good, but then in the same tournament, they'll underwhelm. They'll lose a series they should win. They'll not go as deep as they can. They obviously never at the moment threaten to actually win titles. They just kind of make like quarters or semis and then somehow find a way to lose to almost anyone it feels like. So to me, yeah, there's something off with this liquid mix. It's not the players necessarily, it's just a mix of players so I, I even feel like they're going to be faced in the tough challenge where yes there's this room of fallen leaves but I think it's probably more than one change I'm not even sure what direction you're going as well because I have my questions about all sorts in this team like the leadership angle they've obviously swapped the IGL around a lot of times we still don't really know what impact Adren had as a coach I'm not sure it, it changed that much as far as I can tell everyone seems in the community like they're trying to scrutinize Grim and they want him out the door to be replaced but I just wonder by who like I feel like Team Liquid's in one of the toughest spots they've been in because they've got a good core of players but it's not necessarily like a winning call right now 
No, that's the, that is the, I, I really like that you mentioned that, the fact that they keep changing the leadership, because to me, that actually probably matters the most there. When sure. you don't have something to guide the roster, when you have all that firepower, but you don't have anybody to really decide, this is the way we're going to play this situation, right? I'm calling the shot, just do what I say. I mean, if, if from, I mean, it, it was just every tournament, each tournament, each week, you're like, that's the question. Who's calling for liquid this week? Is it going to be Fallen or is it going to be Stewie? Okay, it's Fallen in the driver's seat this time, and Stewie's helping with the mid-round calls. But then the week after that, it's like, nope, it's back to Stewie calling on that team. How can you have an effective, uh, how can you have a, an effective unit if you're just constantly changing up the leadership? It just means that you're, you're lacking confidence in one another, and that doesn't lead to a, a successful tournament. So, leaving it on Liquid, let's go ahead and move on into, uh, into our champions stage. The top eight of the major and I mean, I, f I feel like we've been blessed. Like this is this is pretty much the who's who of top elite CS teams throughout this year going into the top eight. Navi, Vitality, Furia Esports uh, versus Gambit, Heroic and Virtus Pro, and Nip versus G2. I mean, you it's really just the who's who of elite CS going into this top eight. So was there any one match that really got you excited right out the gates that you were looking forward to? Even though it didn't really deliver on the level you hoped for, just because of how many times online Na'Vi versus Vitality was epic and the whole Zewu versus Simple Angle, if you notice actually for this major, when we get to it later with Na'Vi, it really was like some script writer's dream where you're like, all right, I'm going to start with Zewu versus Simple here, yeah. then I'm going to make it like Na'Vi versus Gambit and all the young part, and then I'm going to make it in the end like Nico waits for them and then one of them has to win a major. It almost was like some anime level stuff, but the right. problem was their first matchup, look, Zewu and Simple played all right, but even they didn't actually go crazy in the matchup. So to me, I just hoped like that Vitality would sort of come. And even if they wouldn't win the major, they would just in this one match, like resurrect some of the form of months and months ago when they really were a true contender to Na'Vi. Because this had, you know, on paper, this could have been one of those sleeper, like, you know, this is the real final type moments if they'd have had an epic series. Sure. But you're right to mention that it's actually Perfecto who ended up topping the uh, scoreboard for Navi uh, in the match against Vitality. Zaiwu was the only team, to, or the only team, the only player to go on his team positive. So the rest of the Frenchmen just lagging behind on an individual level, whereas on Navi's side, I mean, there's it doesn't feel like there's a gap in this roster in terms of individual performance right now. It feels like Boomich even is coming up with his monster plays to add to the plays of the others. You I mean when you've got Electronic Simple and Bit just shredding everybody in front of you, and then even the IGL is uh, getting to contribute. It's an amazing scenario for Navi. Just makes it feel like they're going to be in so much trouble. Do you think, I mean, because there's rumors going around, oh, well, rumors, actually, I think it's confirmed now, isn't it, that uh, Vitality are going for the roster change. Do you think that the Vitality team knew that the changes were happening, or do you think that they they that was kept from them and they were able to focus on the tournament? I'm not sure because the problem is if you know how players are, players themselves leak stuff all the time within the community. So I feel like you'd have to, at minimum, have heard rumblings like maybe our team's one of the ones that's talking to them or maybe we might not be in the squad. Sometimes you can even tell, by the way, just by the fact that like maybe your coach or the guy in the org, just they seem a bit different when you're talking to them this time or asking us, so what's going on with that? You know, they don't give you quite the answers that you expect. So I got the vibe personally of maybe there was some of that sort of behind the scenes. And I'll say as well, in French speaking teams, that's basically just the world they've always lived in in the past like there were always rumours of this guy's going to get caught or do they want to get this guy from the other team there was always all that stuff circling around the social element of the teams you'd even see those people at the bar where you're like that's weird how long Kenny S and Shocks are spending talking to each other over there for an hour wonder what they might be talking you know exactly you can imagine they're just going like my team sucks yeah so does mine wait a minute what if we and then the other team it's like whoa 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 you want to get shots in or something like you know it's, you, there's always that atmosphere so I got a little bit of that vibe like I do think some of the players were a bit underwhelming here quite frankly if you'd have told me before the tournament someone said to um Kyojin, yeah you're probably caught anyway mate that's how i'd imagine he would play like he looked like he was terrible and also he looked like he was just missing in the squad i mean that story you said about apex and zero that sounds awesome from the side of like we won't win the tournament but like he was basically telling him like if you don't hard carry us mate we're just going out now like it's just over like there's isn't gonna be no tournament for us so fair play to zero he still played pretty much fragging out except for this one matchup against the best team aside from that he played very well in in all the other best of threes but i do think this team just what it, it makes sense they're making cuts this isn't the team it was last year when they were one of the best in the world when they had all the amazing elements going for they had the six-man lineup all the great map pool they could match up with astralis with navi like that team never really made it in the 2021 unfortunately i think at this tournament like i said when you saw the problems Kyojin had, man alive, did we miss RPK. He was never obviously a highlight player in these latter years, but he just did his job, didn't he? He knew what to do in the team.
Yeah, it really makes you wonder what prompted the change. I mean, it never really feels like we got the full story on that oh, one. No. So it's just, you know, RPK is retiring, goodbye, and no further information as to like what the re reasoning behind the change was. I mean, you bring Kyojin in, uh, as you say, lack of experience, uh, really making the difference there, it feels like. Um, didn't show up in that series at all. So, yeah, Vitality now, I mean, the real question mark is what's going to happen to them going forward because that's going to be completely crazy. Uh, what we can see from them with uh, two, two two Danish players on the roster and a new coach. So Xta is getting the short end of the stick here. He he can you know he made the top eight with this uh, with this team, but uh, it feels like that's going to be the end of the line for him with uh, Vitality. And we'll have to see what he's capable of doing moving forward. I mean, considering what he was able to do with Vitality, it'd be pretty cool to see him still in the mix. So cross fingers there. Yeah, but what screwed him over, unfortunately, because I've asked him and many people have, like, he just doesn't do any media in English because he's one of those guys who thinks that I cannot speak English. Like, you're speaking English right now to me, but okay. I've always told him, like, okay, you know, there's no translator in it. Are we understanding each other? It's not, we're not in Star Trek. You haven't got the universal translator turned on. But the problem I've noticed is, just like existence, when they decide similar, that they're not going to speak English or worse, that they can't speak English, it's like the mental block that they don't get over. Because I feel as though if this guy actually was, it was understood, like he's available for work with any team, there's a lot of teams should probably go and get him. Look how, you know, he's brought in rookies and he's worked with different teams. He's managed egos and he's been able to do the right cuts of people like Alex and MBK at exactly the right moment and replace them and get people like Shocks and integrate them. So he's done so many things that should actually like, speak to his skills as a coach. But unfortunately, I do think that French angle might kill him dead because think about it this was the last French team and they're changing to be international so at this point you haven't really got anywhere if you're going to be French only that I think you can go and still be relevant in tier one that is the amazing thing isn't it I mean considering the powerhouses that French teams have been for so long now to think that it's been them in the doldrums for a little bit until Vitality showed up and now for them to be the end of the this could be the end of the line for a French roster I mean we got the ponies the ponies are out there still. They didn't quite make the cut in the tournament, unfortunately, qualifying into this one. But uh, the ponies are still out there. So I guess, you know, the French teams, the uh, French fans are really going to have to get behind the ponies going forward if this is how it goes. Um, I mean, other side of the bracket, G2 versus, uh, you know, I was talking about some French players. I mean, Amonek and, Amonek and Jax are on G2. NIP, G2 take this one 2-0. And this is a 16-11, 16-11. And it doesn't really feel like Nip ever, ever got going in this uh, in this series so do you think this was just you know end of the line for g2 they're saying yeah okay we're not messing any we're not wasting any time here with uh, with nip we're just going to hit the ground running and smash through I mean, one thing I know about Nico teams especially is they all do think they are land players and that if anyone else is like good online, like, ah, they will beat them on land. So you got the vibe in this series. Like they didn't think Nip was like true competition for them. They looked like, if, again, if you just look at the map vetoes, et cetera, G2 generally just picked for themselves. They just said, take what we like and then we'll just beat them on whatever. So yeah, I thought this was an example of where Nip could have made this a much better series, but I thought they just capitulated a little bit. It feels like it really was that lack of experience that made the difference here for NIP. And I'm, I mean, I, I was just thinking about that this morning, right? When I made that video on the vice joining the roster and how I thought, okay, now they've got all the pieces, right? You know, they have the support structure and threat. They have the support structure from the team. They have everybody with clear roles. There's no bickering as to who gets to do what or anything. It's all, it all makes sense. Except that they played on a Swedish stage. And that's what I'm wondering. Do you think it was, do you think we could have seen a different level out of NIP had it been in Cologne or anywhere else right if it could have been anywhere else apart from sweden do you think they could have they could have uh, it could have been them progressing forward in the uh, semifinal to the semifinals i know that a lot of people think me and lerp is famous because we're two of the iconoclasts and this is like we're the ones who don't subscribe to the, like home crowd theory it's not that it's that i think you the, that home crowd aspect could work both ways so you could have a time where you're like the guys like for me this is what was happening with people like bit it's almost like they didn't realize they were a major they were just playing and they saw my joke was it's like the road runner wiley coyote scenario you run off the edge of the cliff but it's not until you look down you realize wait a minute i'm off the edge and then you fall like before like you're running fine aren't you so i got sure. the vibe that like sometimes i think g2 maybe even did this at times you're just blowing people off the server and you're like ah this is fine yeah not this is no different than it was online the problem with nip was i got the vibe personally that the pressure to make it to the playoffs was huge and then it didn't relieve actually when they were in this match here if anything think about that the way this game was going as well the Inferno game was the one where they started on T side of their map Inferno and Nico himself was just dominating them he had like 22 kills in like you know I'm going to say like 11 rounds or something mental which is almost more kills than everyone on Nip and in that scenario 
video, you're in front of a cr home crowd, you'll be getting blasted. Like, you're in front of a crowd and you're powerless to do anything. That's got to be the worst feeling in the world. That's what people don't get, is that as much as it can buy you up, those are the same people who expectantly are watching you now get stuffed. And I've sometimes felt that can snowball against you as well. I've seen it happen, by the way, even with, like, French teams, for example, because they also would always want the crowd behind them. But tell you what, if you get stuffed by, like, Fnatic or something, sometimes it sucks that oh, you got all the extra pressure as well. Without a doubt, I remember it. Uh, I remember I got to cast that game, and I was really excited to see it because immediately on Inferno, both teams charged mid and just started swinging. And I'm like, I am so happy that both of these teams called this strat in particular because this to me speaks of a strat where it's just like we need to take the fight immediately, not let them get comfortable. And I thought, okay, this bodes well for Nip, right? It didn't go get, it didn't go their way in that pistol. They got their heads taken off, but you know, it's like okay, they, they're showing up with a fighting spirit. The only problem is, is that Nico just showed up and he was just an ogre. And eventually and there wasn't anything they can do to stop him. Oh, it felt like he was like, he was ready to fight and he wasn't going down. So, you know, it's, a, I, I admired Nip's call, you know, right. That the, the, the fact that they, they go for the aggressive call, they stuck with it and they really tried to go for the fight immediately against G2. But yeah, like you say, I mean, G2, I mean, G2 and Nico, Nico is just an absolute monster. So if we step up one, I mean, back over here towards like greener pastures, I guess, where Gambit Esports were able to take down Furia. Do you think like, okay, Gambit, is this, are you, the fact that they get Furia first round, does this bode well for them? Or do you think that uh, this is kind of setting them, setting ourselves up with false, uh, with a false sense of security that they're here to play well? They'd have just blown Furia off the server, it'd be fine. But the problem I had was even the Furia series was hard work for Gambit. Like, I know a lot of other people were saying, no, but look at the composure they should. It's like, if they, they should have destroyed Furia. Like, they, they, they were put into a scenario where they almost lost the first map. So I actually thought this already showed me that, like, Gambit hadn't really adapted to the LAN environment. Like, if anything, Furia looked, despite the fact they're a weaker team, like, they were more comfortable in that series to me. That is, uh, I mean, nineteen seventeen on Inferno, the first map of that series. So you're right; it was just like already it turns into a bloodbath right out the gates. And, and I wonder if, um, if this was Gambit really adjusting right out the gates because I remember watching this series and just watching that that pack of Fury of fans right in front of them just going ballistic every single round. And I wonder if uh, Gambit, you know, that might be getting into their heads a little bit all of a sudden because. The fans are just going, are popping off each and every round, and they're still up there trying to get used to playing on stage. Do you think that was a that way that weighed in at all on this? The problem is, like, people don't realize Gambit as a team, basically minus Hobbit, are just a product of the online era. Like, they were the best of the online era team, sure. But the point is, those players, some of them barely have Tier 2 LAN experience. Like, forget the idea of Tier 1. Like, if you go back on people like Shero's page on Liquipedia, you're going to find, like, I think, like, one DreamHack Open or something years ago. That's it. The guy's never done anything beyond that. So, to actually expect a whole team to hit the ground running and get to the peak form, that was never going to happen. I just wanted them to have more of like you know some of the sort of like killer edge they had online where they would just crush you with some of the tactical elements or some of the ele like for example Nefani would just call an amazing T side if it was online some of these things translated a bit it was certainly good enough to get past a lot of teams and I will say I'd love to know what would happen if, if they were on the other side of the bracket would they have been in the final for example that might have been a more interesting challenge but I think ultimately like the Gambit story it, even though they made semis at a major which sounds wild they, it won't be remembered that favourably actually because as you say you look at who they beat in the Swiss system wasn't that impressive and then you look who they got in the round of eight arguably the the team you'd want them out of everyone so the team you'd, you'd ask for feels like it right yeah it feels like it that was definitely i mean a draw they managed to dodge uh virtus pro and that was going to be the next team that i wanted to talk about because yeah gambit i mean gambit they go into the quarterfinals like that we've already touched a little bit on what they were able to achieve in the semifinals which was essentially just getting eaten alive by navi so that was uh, by no means a, a good uh, solution for or a good situation for Gambit there. Um, but real quick before moving into the semis, you know, heroic Virtus Pro. Uh, what do we think about the Virtus Pro roster? Was this them? I mean, because that was not an easy match at all for heroic. They, it was a full on fight, all three maps. Not uh, no blowout here. I mean, VP made heroic fight for it. So does this bode well for VP going forward, or is this a roster that's going to need to make some changes? I actually think, obviously, they made the flip roster move. I think, listen, I don't know about the timing of that. If I'm going to do roster move, I'd rather have a couple of tournaments to lead into the major. But I thought, overall, they managed it pretty well. Like, they certainly had hit and miss performances in terms of some of the stars. Like, for example, I think on the last map of the entire tournament, Jim was a little bit whack and kind of, like, maybe cost his team a few rounds. But you have a look at other rounds elsewhere. It's true, for the whole major, he wasn't playing like he was online. But he still, at time, could have impact. He kind of is obviously a really good player. I think they've got the pieces there in 
the squad. To me, it is a good team. It's just that at the moment, like, I, I mean, I just think basically they couldn't grind forever. You can't just always have every series go three maps, like 30 rounds. 30, you can't can't just always be in that scenario. You're not always going to be the one who sort of makes the great escape as it were. Because in this series even, they actually had time, so it looks like they were going to get through where they could have 2-0, they could have maybe been three map team and go through. The problem as a team was, I think they lacked a tiny bit of firepower, but I put some of that down to just bringing in a brand new player right before the tournament. I think if you look at the actual performances of who they beat and who they played against, it was pretty good. I thought actually they kind of like performed a little bit above what they should have i mean actually making it in i mean it was uh looking back at the group phase now they did have to go all the way it wasn't like they managed to get through 3-1 in their group they went 3-2 and they eliminated phase to get a spot in the top eight so i mean virtus pro it really was like that's a good way to put it it really was a grind for them this tournament so making it all the way i mean one thing that i was really happy to see that team with that team is that yakinder just never let off like he was always in there trying to just utterly destroy everybody. He played aggressive. He played his style, it felt like. It felt like he really stuck to it. And that was one of the questions that I had going into it, whether or not he would be able to bring that kind of level to this uh, to this atmosphere. And so to see him still popping off and playing very well, and actually off the top of my head, I'm trying to remember where he wound up. Uh, yeah, Yakinder 1.09 at the end with, after 12 maps. So, I mean, still kind of up there in the green but not necessarily hitting that all-star level uh but still like sticking true to his style that's one of the things that watching him i was really enjoying oh no i mean the, the key thing is like he was never going to be as good as he was online because just some of those players don't work online but if you notice vp ever since he joined his actual playing style was basically in instrumental to them being a top team because when they used to only play around jim people eventually figured that out like you can kind of tell what he's going to save you can eventually get an idea for when he's not going to play aggressive on you and so to me the akinda jim dynamic is what gave new life to vp so i still personally look at the squad and i think if you give them a couple of months I'm very interested once Flit is properly bedded in if they won't just be a grinder team if they can actually just win out right then because they again also looked like a team that as the tournament went on the map pool got better they even found they could win on maps they should have had no business on like Ancient by the way like there's no universe where they should have been winning that but they were winning it a couple of times against teams basically punish picking it into them so I think as a squad they do have actually some sort of potential for the future like I could see them being like fifth best team in the world if they get everything together certainly have the firepower of looking over again i mean they're all pretty much above 1.0 rating even though they suffered a loss right uh even it's flit who's like the no jame actually was lowest with 0.97 but i mean still come on like that's that's still in there it's still the what you need if you've got the firepower so that's cool to see but uh moving into the semifinals now i mean we did touch on this earlier we can iterate reiter, reiterate uh, the fact that navi they did just blow through Gambit Esports. I mean, was that the, it felt like that was going to be a monster match to have in the semifinals. Then we'd get another legendary semifinals out of that one. And yet Gambit, yeah, just did not show up. The problem is the biggest factor that should have made that a good series, no matter what form Gambit was in, is how many times Gambit had beaten Na'Vi. Like in theory, I always say when you beat someone in a match, it's why I don't buy this idea of like, ah, they were just saving strats for the major and, you know, they lose. It. No, no one does that. No one likes their rival to beat them because every time your rival beats you, you get like a little psychological wound. And so I did always think actually, like to me, the Na'Vi players, when they played against Gambit, they actually did sort of take some of those losses badly and did think, oh, we're supposed to be the best CIS team. So you hoped, right, that Gambit could recreate some of that vibe. And as a result, they could, it's not that they would go up to Na'Vi's level, they bring Na'Vi down to their level and it'd become one of those games we saw online. But unfortunately, Na'Vi basically never looked back at that point. And so no one stopped them until the final, basically. That's when they had their first real test. So because they were just blowing everyone off the server, like the overpass game is the best example in this series. Because I saw rounds Nafani called, which looked like a good round. Like online, you win that round. You get all your utility in, you move the CTs to the part of the bomb spot you want, you run on the site, you take your jewels all you have to do is trade remember that's the key for the t side just trade and you get your kills and you get the bomb planted there weren't bomb plants in these scenarios they would run in and like simple or perfecto or any of these players would just be there instantly two of them would get a kill or they'd get a double kill on one guy and then the bomb site hit was just dead and then gambit was like oh well try again next round so i felt like gambit unfortunately they didn't play anywhere close to their online form but the other problem is navi just played lights out and this is another series where there's nothing you could do against them like if people don't know in this 
this particular series, like Boomich before the final was like ranked, I don't know, like the 15th highest rated player in the tournament. If you went and looked, all of his plus minus kill differential was just from this one series where he was just farming everyone on the A site. So and if even Boomich is going to put like a plus 24 or plus 26 against you, you're going to have a really hard time beating Na'Vi. Actually, I'm trying to catch back into this again. Yeah, simple. <sighs> Oh man, like all of his first kills, I'm just looking at it like 5, 10, 11, 12 first kills in the series. I mean, he finishes with a 1.87 rating at the end of that. So that really leans pretty hard into what you were talking about where... And it wasn't like he was the only player carrying, like you said, like everyone else is fragging as well. Yeah. They're all up there. Simple. Boomich with 1.43. Electronic with 1.4. I mean, it, it really is feeling like Navi were just firing on all cylinders and they knew 100% how they were going to approach... Uh, how they were going to approach this game. Yeah, simple with 12 opening kills and then 28 op kills. So Shiro not even able, not in the slightest, able to go up toe-to-toe -to -toe versus Simple in that series. Simple just blew him completely out of the water. I mean, do you think, sure, this comes down to a lot of the experience. I know that this was mentioned a lot on the desk as well, going into a lot of these series that Shiro, you know, just wait until we get into the CT side. Just wait until we get into the CT side and this is where we're going to see this guy pop off and start taking over. Do you think there was too much pressure on his shoulders as that AWP or... Or was it about right, the expectations? Uh, the problem I have is there's two factors. One, like I say, some of the Na'Vi players did just basically get like insta-kill scenarios. Like if you ever watch Bit play, he doesn't do normal kills. He just immediately headshots two people in like a half a second. Well, if that happens, that can destroy any round, right? My yeah. problem is this. When I did see Sim Shiro in rare scenarios where he would have normally re-peaked and gotten the kill, I thought he also let pressure get to him. He looked like he positioned more conservatively, he whiffed certain shots. And I do think, unfortunately, well, he wasn't the only player having a bad game, but the team collapsed when they didn't have like the consistent firepower you normally get from him because he normally is the guy where me and Maniac always say the reason he's a great opera is he never misses an easy shot so if you just give him a normal shot at the edge of the his crosshair when he's holding it on the angle he's going to hit that so I just felt like in this particular series he wasn't able to be dominant with that style like he just looked okay he looked like an average player that was the main takeaway here is that, yeah, Shiro, it feels like really going into this one, you know, you got like the Axel Shiro combo and then the Hobbit combo. Well, it feels like, I like, it feels like that is kind of what the story tells as well. If you just look at the stats coming right out of that series again, you know, Hobbit fighting the good fight, trying to do what he could with that experience. And you could tell at least that was, I mean, real quick side note, but that was one of the very, the very nice things about our casting setup is that because we were perched up in the, in the, in the rafters, essentially we could look down on the stage and see the players, right. And just see the body language and everything like that. And I got to cast this game and it always felt like I was looking down and everybody's just kind of frozen in their own little bubble on the side of Gambit, right? It's, it feels like they're all kind of like deer caught in the headlights and Hobbit was trying to help out, but I mean, there's only so much you can do at that point, I think. It wasn't like he was just going to have all of the answers because it definitely looked like he was a bit frozen up as well in terms of not knowing how to take the fight to Na'Vi. So maybe this was just an all, I mean, maybe it almost certainly is just a, a lack of experience on the team. And hopefully what will happen is that next time we get onto land in front of an audience, now that they'll have experienced it once, we'll get to actually see, you know, was this the truth? Is this what, was this the ceiling for Gambit? Or is there that level? Now that they have that experience, are they going to be able to tap into it? Has that happened much in your experience in the past? Oh, Lord. Some of the best, but the most decorated player in the history of CSGO is get his um, device. And he choked a million semis and majors and all sorts of matches. So if you're Gambit, right, the good news is, look, it is very young in your careers. You've got plenty more chances. You should actually, if you look at this core, you should be able to stay together for years and years with this team and do a lot of things. The downside is, though, you also don't know how many times you ever come in as a real tournament favorite and actually have a chance. Like in this case, right. you're playing a team that you've beaten all year long. Like on paper, you're supposed to have a chance to get through that match. So my problem is in isolation, terrible performance. If you look at the macro picture, perfectly fine to make it to the semifinals of a major on your first try. Yeah, that's the thing. I mean, that's, uh, that, that is the thing. We are talking about the semifinals of the major here. So you're right. Making top four, there's no shame in that. And then, of course, they always get to have that out where they get to say, well, we lost to the team that won it, right? Exactly. You know, so no shame in that. You lost to Navi. Didn't look like anybody was going to stop Navi, including the two teams that were on the other side of the semifinals, Heroic and G2. I mean, this was an all-out just war between these two teams, and it ends in overtime on Inferno as well. But this was a really fun match to cast. It felt like everybody was just swinging for the fences. Nico was just doing his damnedest. But then on the other side, it felt like Heroic, 
man, heroic. Just the fact that these guys really just stick together statistically. It feels like there's no weak spot on this team. Everybody's just hitting shots. It's actually crazy. The one thing maybe that we can take out of this is that do you think it, it was a do you think the pressure was getting to Cadian? Because it feels like in a couple of these uh, in a couple of these situations, he wasn't really showing up in the same way, and maybe the the, the leadership aspect of things was kind of getting to him here on the main stage. I also just think like I never personally expected Cadian to be a monster offline. I thought he was more product of the online era in that sense. Like his numbers were way too high at times during the end of last year and early this year. So my problem is I didn't expect him to be as good because if you ever look at his style of play, he plays like he's simple, but no one told him he isn't simple. Like everything's like a super fast flick and like jiggle peek in a corner all the time. Like it's really hard to do that and hit the shot every time. It's why we all look at simple and we're like this guy's an alien man. I don't know how he does hit those flicks with such re- So the problem I have with Cadian was he does an okay job and he has such good players in his team by the way he doesn't have to frag out like um, obviously people like Stown especially Avo, um, like Tessis Shush and basically almost everyone in his team had a good tournament this time actually like you say he's one of the only ones who maybe had a couple of games off I thought generally his team was very good and for me I'm looking more towards like how do you do in terms of calling see like he did a pretty good job they, Heroic was a team that despite not winning a lot of matches earlier in the tournament they were always in every single best of three that's why it was underwhelming that they were going through 3-2 like they could have won every best of three they played in this tournament effectively so I think they, they're still a very good team and for me this team unlike Gambia they're not onliners at all they looked fantastic in this semi-final I thought even the heart they played with to do that massive comeback at the end like there was many worlds I could have seen where they were in the final and I actually think they were the only team in the tournament once we knew Gambit wasn't legit that had the map pool to maybe have matched up with Na'Vi I don't think they would have won I think they probably would have been demoralized by the fragging but they would have had at least had a, a chance on paper Without a doubt, they would have. I mean, getting into it, really, what I want to do is focus on this uh, G2 uh, roster and just, again, the engine that Nico is, that he's able to just keep powering forward. But one thing that got uh, mentioned on the desk and that was really cool to catch up with, I believe it was Maniac actually mentioning this on the desk, is that he got to catch up with Malek, the coach for G2. And um, he got one of the answers to one of the questions that we had going into this. And that was, you know, how are these players going to perform when they get onto the main stage? And Malik was just, you know, Hunter is in his element. There was no, he didn't skip a beat. He, in fact, just feels like he leveled up on land and that in front of the audience, he was able to just pop off and go crazy. And um, so a little bit of a side story or a little bit of a, a backstory. Apparently, uh, it's best not to try and rile Hunter up when he's on the stage because that just gets him more motivated to mess you up. Because apparently, in the iconic photo of him, you know, with his with his hand behind his ear, right? Apparently, in the front row, there was a fan who, uh, a heroic fan, who kept pointing at Hunter and pointing at G two and just going like, you know, making like a throat cutting kind of thing and like just constantly trying to get his attention when things were going against him or going against him in that map or you know, just constantly trying to rile up uh, the G two side. And so when G two do win that map, when Hunter wins that map in that fashion, you know, that's why he's popping off. He's popping off, you know, specifically at that guy going, you know, like you want to say something else? You want to, you know, apparently it was all just like between Hunter and him. But of course, to the rest of us, it looks like it's the whole audience at large, right? right? So it just all lines up that way. But that was a little bit of a side story in it where it was really just like this one guy who may be responsible for Hunter just taking over and doing what he did on that stage. Yeah, the other thing for G2, in my opinion, is up until the semi-final, they all had their contributions. Like, obviously, people like Amanek and Jax aren't going to top the scoreboard, but you look at how they play in the game. Like, Jax does find some crazy, like, kills out of nowhere. Amanek actually a fairly reliable player. He's just not a great opera. The other three all were in, like, the top-rated players. Like, I even said going into the final, think about how crazy this sounds. If I told you the top three players for G2 were all in the top 16 rated players of the tournament, you think, right, they must have be the favourite. And I was like, yeah, the bad news is Navi's got three in the top five or whatever you know so yeah. in that scenario you know what I mean they were just outgunned so I thought the problem overall was this they had a really they almost had themselves like a miracle run until the semis then in the semis and the final it was mainly Nico and Nico just was doing the hard carrying he just wasn't going to be denied basically and if you were going to win you'd have to beat his teammates basically and I think that's what some of these teams did Heroic couldn't do it just barely but Navi obviously did in the final there you go and I mean we might as well just segue straight into the grand final because I mean it was so close, so close, pixels away from going to a third map. It feels like, right? With that eventual, with that massive round, the 15 12 scenario where it's out on nuke and Nico comes up with that deagle and doesn't hit the shot. So, I mean, did this final live up to your expectations with Simple versus Nico? Was that the storyline? Or was there something else that we should have been watching out for? 
The problem I thought overall was like Nico was a little bit underwhelming on the first map of Ancient. And also I thought Ancient looked closer than it was. Like basically G2 won a whole bunch of massive clutches in that game that sort of kept them in it, you know. Then, so that one, and also because they'd picked Ancient as like a weird sort of gamble pick, you needed them to win that to feel confident the series was going to be amazing. Then you go to Nuke. I think a lot of the excitement there was just the idea that like it's supposed to be this impregnable fortress for Na'Vi. They've won 17 in a row, whatever it was at that point in time, like unbeatable blood. So at the time you thought, right, easy win. They just close out the major. I will say in that game, I thought Nico played great, but I do think overall, he, the problem is he couldn't play like Simple could because not only was Simple posting like the highest numbers you can imagine, but then he also had all his teammates playing well as well. So to me, it's like it wasn't a fair fight. This wasn't like the old days where Simple and Nico might play and it could in theory just be the two of them battling against each other. As Zewu found out, Simple's got too much firepower behind him just in his teammates now. So at this point in time, you have to actually hope Simple plays like a mortal and then some of his teammates have a game off. So you're not really going to beat this Na'Vi. They've got the cheat code as it were at the moment. So I thought Nico played all right in the final, certainly on Nuki had some big moments the tough part is G2 were already on a Cinderella story to be in a position to go through a third map in a grand final of a major like there's many other worlds where I think where they could have gone out in many of the other phases of the tournament other rounds of the tournament so I thought they played well overall but eventually like I kept saying this in the games when I was watching them do it with the guys in the green room I was like they're doing well in the first half of each of these games but if you just give them too many rounds eventually these Navi fraggers are going to wake up mate they're not just going to sit back like if people didn't know on both of the, the maps in the final Simple was like a quiet start at the beginning of the game then he just went supernova second half every time and so if you if you let a guy drop like 20 kills in the second half you're going to have a very hard time winning that series yeah, that's the main issue, actually. I mean, even on the second half of uh, Nuke, it was Navi on that uh, CT side. But uh, Navi, you know, T side on the, on Ancient, it was 8-7 at the half. And then all of a sudden, it is just Navi pounding face. G2 picked up four rounds in that second half on Ancient. And it really felt like Navi were just running game on them, on them at that point. So for there to be that much of a fight on Nuke, it's fair play to G2 after the same sure. result on Ancient. I was like, Ooh, is this just going to be a blowout? You know, because how are, are G2 going to show us the grit? to be able to take a fight against Na'Vi when they just lost their map pick on Ancient like that. So that had me wondering for sure. I mean, credit to uh, Hunter as well, though. I, you know, again, just to mention, but I mean, he is pretty much the second rated player after uh, Nico on that, in that match. You know, he is a monster. Uh, so you got to give it to, to, to Hunter as well, like the Kovac and Koj Kovac meme. But it does feel like at least, uh, you know, Nico has his cousin uh, to back him up to an extent. I mean, overall, like, it's the only other play you could really rely on in that lineup. I think that's the thing we really learned from G2. If you think about even when they were at their best online, but they would always finish third and fourth, right? It was only when they got to Land of Cologne they had the run to the final. The problem this team had was, I thought they had, like, just enough firepower, but then they didn't have a good enough map pool. And I think actually in the final, like, trying to do this gamble pick, like, if you notice how they ran the whole playoffs, they just picked Mirage was their whole map the whole time, and they basically just said, if you can beat us on it, fair play, you win. If you don't, then maybe we take you this series and we win overall so i think actually this team like i applied it before it wasn't that it was a dead team like i think a bunch of these players will stay but there was a vibe like we aren't playing in an org that goes oh great job second place like Carlos from G2 wants to win, mate. And also, more importantly, if you tell him Nico's one of the best players in the world and you're not winning, then he knows something's wrong with that equation. That means I've got to change the team around this guy because I've got a Messi or Ronaldo, so I've got to put the players around. So I'm the champion. I don't want to be the guy going, good, oh, it's nice to come second place. So I think there were a lot of the players, unlike some of the other teams, maybe auditioning for their jobs. These players played up to par. They did a great job. They got way further than they probably should have. They almost got to a third map against Na'Vi. Fair play to them for that. But I do think this is like a fundamentally Lord squad and some of these players it's just that they have to be in different teams they could probably have careers elsewhere as far as Navi are concerned I mean right now simple this is it he's finally achieved it there's a magical picture of him and you know electronic essentially just having a hug say you know I mean that's that's the that is like the the culmination to a years-long process for those two players in particular they've been at each other's sides forever and here they have it finally hoisting the major I mean going into it had you predicted that they were going to be the major winners Yes, I did think that they were the obvious favourite. The only question for me 
because I think a lot of people forgot this as the tournament went on, is what does happen to those three less experienced players. Boomich was in the quarters of a major, obviously with the Na'Vi team afterwards, but with the QB fire, which is considered the biggest fluke ever. So no one really counts that as legit. Perfecto and Bit have no experience in a big portion of a major. Like I think like, I think Perfecto was in like, you know, the week one of a major, the old major qualifier when he was in Simon Gaming. That's about it. So the idea like everyone would hold up as the playoff run went on, and especially that Bit would continue to post massive numbers. I could easily have seen that drop off at any point in the playoffs but didn't and so as a result Na'Vi basically they were exactly what normally never happens which is a dominant team comes into the major and just really never looks back and just wins the whole thing normally you at least get tested you have a moment or maybe you get knocked out early by some shock opponent this really was like what you what should have been with Team Liquid a couple of years ago you know where they should have just breezed through the major that's a fair point I mean it's, it's... I'm looking back at it now again, you know, just uh, the, the overarching picture here is that simple does go plus 31 in the grand final. <laughs> <laughs> plus in the eight. final alone, exactly. I, <laughs> that is just so insane. Nothing was going to stop him from going through. Even, you know, Nico, second highest rated player in the tournament. You know, he only goes plus two in that final 1.13 rating. I mean, simple's up there with plus 31, 1.5 insane how there used to be a logic right that basically from team sports at the nba they would always say this if you have like a dominant player on a team that you're playing against but the rest of the team isn't good what they actually say similar is we won't put all our effort into stopping the dominant player we let him get his points but we just shot all his teammates down because one player doesn't beat you so in the nba for example if he has a 50 point game that's fine as long as the rest of his team combined gets like 30 or 40 points and we get 100 so we win 100 to 90 180 right that's the logic the problem is you can't can't do that against simple anymore because in a world where he gets 40 or 50 then the others get 30 and 25 and it's like it's over like the firepower is too crazy like i think actually the cool thing for me at the end of this major is if you are g2 you don't go that was unfair you go no their team's unfair and if you are vitality you go of course i make this monster move where i gamble everything and bring in the Strauss players like i think the coolest thing about the way the navi team won undefeated is if you were a team out there with money to spend and ambition to be number one you have to make an enormous to move and gamble at all because you aren't going to put in like a good lineup and win the major against these guys they're too good so that was that's what i want to end this on is actually a prediction do you think that navi maintain this this shape this form going forward or do you think that this is they've reached it and we'll actually see them kind of take a step back they even could like a couple of the players could get like 10 15 percent worse and the team's still good enough to be number one in the world and beat absolutely everyone like right now it looks all odds on like we are going to be in the navi era like give it a couple more times give it a blast give it the next first ones of next year and they'll be in a position where we'll be talking about a team that love won like you know six or seven tournaments a major the grand slam like at that point in time we're going to be in those like historical conversations we're not even about this time period it's about like how do they look against astralis and sk and Fnatic and all the old great teams because like they everything just points towards that I mean remember when they were originally getting to the top it was on the back of like Mirage they would play maps like this right they've now got this nuke that they've won like 19 in a row 18 in a row or something so it's like this. these are impossible numbers guys it's amazing it's amazing it's really cool to get to watch it all unfold in front of us and well this was it was really nice having you on the show today Duncan thank you so much for uh, providing I mean your insight and the historical knowledge uh, going in and uh, your thoughts on the major results uh, but uh, I think that's a good place to call it on a prediction going forward, uh, whether or not Navi will continue with this as the Navi era or if they're going to uh, take that step back. It's going to be really fascinating to see because uh, we're not done yet with the year of uh, Counter-Strike. There's more events coming up. We should have another LAN coming up in a couple weeks' time uh, with the uh, Blast Fall Final. So, I mean, that's going to be hype. We're going to get to see if these guys can play on stage again and whether or not they can do back-to-back. Uh, -back. Uh, land performance so uh, it's going to be really cool to see but again thank you very much Thorne for joining me on the show this has been Pop Flash by DJ Esports and uh, we'll see you all next time